Well, good afternoon, everybody. We'll, we'll go ahead and get started with the webinar today. So thank you all for attending. And usually I forget to introduce myself, so I will do that right now because it's written down on the piece of paper that I should rem remember to introduce myself. Um, my name is Paul Geringer. I'm the Extension Legal Specialist here with um, the University of Maryland. And today our webinar will be focusing on the recent Idaho ag gag ruling. Um, we have two wonderful speakers for this topic today. Um, first, we have Ashley Newhall, who will kind of walk through um, some of the things that were left open after the ruling. And then we have Aaron Howley from the University of Missouri um, to discuss the ruling in detail. And I am going to let them both introduce themselves um, mainly because mainly because of time issues so I will go ahead and let them get started I will let you know automatically we have an evaluation if you look over to your um, right in the middle box um, there is an evaluation there we also have links to Aaron's presentation we did not have enough time to get Ashley's presentation up um, before the start of the webinar but we will send out links to all of those to you um, after the webinar and again with a link and a recording to this uh, webinar if you want to watch it again or you miss or you're not here for some reason which I don't know why I'm talking to you but I will hand it over to Ashley and let her get started so all right thank you Paul um, as I pull up my presentation, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I am also an Extension Legal Specialist with the Agriculture Law Education Initiative with the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics at University of Maryland College Park. And I'm going to go ahead and go over um, what farm protection laws are, or ag-gag laws, whatever you prefer to call them. And then um, I guess I should go to my overview slide here. Um, and then why they exist and go over which states have them and then also pending litigation also outside of Idaho's current, um, I'm sorry, recent decision. So what are farm protection laws? If you're here, you might have some idea of what they are, but just for our purposes today, they refer to anti-whistleblower laws that restrict employees from taking photographs or videos um, to basically defraud the business or take those to the media and either unfortunately advertise what's going on or falsely advertise what's going on. So the evolution of ag gag laws. So some states have what's called animal enterprise interference statutes and these basically focus on the physical damage to facilities so either burning down buildings or breaking down fences, and this is where the beginning of farm protection laws began. Um, so Kansas was the first in this sort of law in 1991, and it was followed by Washington State, California, Oregon, Montana, and North Dakota. So again, these were more focused on damage to the facility, not so much undercover investigation. However, they, it was peppered throughout some of them. So from there, we're going to talk about what's going on today. So today, um, ag-gag legislation can be said to criminalize up to five different categories of behavior. So these are kind of a way to more easily look at what kinds of ag-gag laws are out there. So the first one I'm going to talk about is known as no recording. So no recording, photographing, videotaping, or audio recording at agriculture facilities. The second one can be um, called no distributing. So this is possession or distribution of recordings made on agriculture facilities. So say the individual was given this footage and decided to go ahead and share it on social media. This would be an example of the no distributing. Um, obtaining access to an agricultural facility production facility, sorry, under false pretenses. This is called no lying. I call this no lying because this is only looked at um, from the agriculture facility perspective. This doesn't go above and beyond, which I'll talk about here in a second, to all industries. So number four, um, AK mandatory disclosure. So failure to report recorded abuse and or relinquish recordings within a stated time frame. And I'll talk about this further in a moment. There is one state that actually does have this in their farm protection statute that requires handing over 
to um, just escaped my train of thought there to um, police investigators that sort of situation um, and then number five is the act of gaining employment again this is in any industry by giving false or incomplete application information when the purpose to gain employment is to create a recording within the facility so this is what I've coined employment fraud and this goes in covers all industries and this is mostly encompassed in the North Carolina um, fire protection law that came out earlier this year so which states have enacted them? So Kansas, again, um, 1990, 1991 was the first ag-gag law. In 1991, you have North Dakota and Montana. In 2011, there were four proposed bills, but none passed. So you can see there's about 10 years before we see this coming about again. And then in 2012, you have 10 proposed bills and three that passed. That included Iowa, Missouri, and Utah. In 2013, there were 15 proposed bills, but none passed. 2014 we have Idaho and then this year we had North Carolina so that's kind of a mini timeline you can see how things have evolved um, so which categories do each of these states fall in so many of these statutes fall under more than one sorry many of the statutes fall under more than one criminalization category so Kansas is your basic no recording in North Dakota you have no distributing and no recording and I went ahead and um, laid out where you can find each of these statutes. So later on, if you do um, get the link to the website, you can go ahead and look these up if you want to read them in more detail. But for time purposes today, I won't do that. Um, and then Montana, you have no distributing and no recording. In Iowa, you have no lying, so that's only agriculture industry um, employment fraud. And then Missouri, you have the mandatory disclosure, so that's a requirement to hand over to um, either state, police, federal, something to that effect, you have a certain limit amount of days. And again, if you visit the statute, it'll have the amount of days you have. I believe it's actually 48 hours, but don't quote me on that. Um, and then Utah, no recording and no lying. In Idaho, you have no recording and no lying. And then North Carolina, you have employment fraud, all industries. So not just agriculture. So why are there ag gag laws? And I like to point out Governor McCrory from North Carolina, his, um, his quote here, these laws were intended to address a valid concern of states' businesses, how to discourage those bad actors who seek employment with the intent to engage in corporate espionage or act as an undercover investigator. So this practice is unethical and unfair to employers and is a particular problem for the agricultural industry. It needs to be stopped. So. so there are a lot of concerns over protecting the business and the industry as a whole. So you have privacy concerns, safety of animals, safety of persons, biosecurity, especially with the current avian flu issues, um, ability to continue production. So the economic effects of videos can be extremely devastating. Um, unfortunately, just because one farm is um, looked at on the media, one picture, if it's a dairy cow, unfortunately, it's going to affect all dairies, all milk prices, so it does have a huge economic impact on an industry as a whole, not just the one, the one farm that was photographed or videoed. Um, the expense to defend, again, it's a huge economic impact, and the footage can often be taken out of context or falsely acted. I know there's a lot of questions coming through. If Paul or Aaron see that I need to answer them right away, I will. If not, we will just take them at the end. But I will try to get to everyone's questions. So current litigation. So Utah's Farm Protection Law was enacted in 2012 and it criminalizes fraudulent employment and recording images or sound without the owner's consent. So this is the no recording and no lying categories. So in Utah, one person was actually prosecuted under Utah's law for filming a slaughterhouse worker pushing a cow with a bulldozer. But this was dropped because the defendant was standing on public property and he wasn't actually trespassing, which um, was required in the statute for Utah. So there was no violation of the law. Um, on July 22, 2013, PETA and some other groups filed a lawsuit challenging Utah's law, alleging it was, again, violation of right to freedom of speech and equal protection. Um, and they also hung it on the Federal False Claims Act and um, 
which is designed to protect whistleblowers on fraud and abuse in government contracts. So they were trying to tie in that the the farms were actually providing the food for schools, and that actually was a government contract. So that's how they were able to pull this Federal False Claims Act in. So in Utah, they have filed a scheduling order, and a trial will happen in the third quarter of 2016. And that's as current as I know. If there's something else out there that someone knows that I don't, please feel free feel free to share in the chat box, um, but that's where I know it's at currently. So Idaho's litigation. This is just a, a preview of what Aaron's going to dive into, but Idaho's Farm Protection Law was enacted February 28, 2014, and criminalizes fraudulent employment, trespass, or secretly filming without the owner's consent. So no recording and no lying again. So again, the similar activists sued the state to enjoin enforcement of the law many of the same plaintiffs in Utah. The lawsuit was based on the Federal False Claims Act, the Food Safety Modernization Act, and the Clean Water Act. And on September 9, 2014, the judge determined that the First Amendment and equal protection challenges to the law were valid and allowed those two claims to move forward to trial. And as we know, on August 3rd, 2015, the judge found that the law violated the First Amendment and equal protection clause. So that's what I have for you for a um, basically overview of farm protection laws in the United States right now. And I will go ahead and hand it over to Erin as she dives into the constitutional analysis of Idaho's ruling. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ashley. It's a pleasure to be with you all. I'm an associate professor at the University of Missouri School of Law. I grew up on a ranch in northeast New Mexico. Uh, Cow-calf operation is the sixth generation, uh, so I have a deep love of agriculture. Um, and I'm excited that one of my courses that I teach at the University of Missouri uh, is, in fact, agricultural law. One of my other interests is constitutional law. I clerked for Chief Justice uh, John Roberts. A few years back, in this case in particular, ALDF versus Otter combines both of those interests. So we're going to take a deep dive uh, into the rationales uh, supporting that decision. So we'll begin here with the text. Uh, so Idaho Code Section 18-7042 is the provision at issue uh, in what's known as the Idaho Ag Gag Law case. Uh, and a bit of background. Um, as Ashley mentioned, this statute was enacted in 2014 following the release of some undercover video from a dairy in Idaho. So that's sort of the background. Uh, in the wake of that, the Idaho legislature passes the statute, uh, and the statute uh, basically deals with two types of uh, interference with ag operations, one of those being misrepresentations, uh, one of those, uh, the second, is actually mentioned being audio or video recordings. So the second slide sort of summarizes this. Uh, under the Idaho law, it's a crime to make a misrepresentation when requesting a tour, um, when obtaining records, and also uh, when seeking employment. Uh, secondly, it's a crime to videotape or audio record at an ag facility without permission. So the penalty for this is a felony offense, uh, punishable by up to one year in prison, and the person uh, recording or uh, lying to gate entry is also liable to the business owner for twice the economic loss. So this occasioned a challenge uh, by the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Uh, that organization argued that the statute uh, was unconstitutional because it stifled public debate about agriculture. Uh, by criminalizing employment-based undercover operations and by criminalizing investigative journalism and whistleblowing. Uh, in particular, they brought uh, two constitutional challenges, 
one under the free speech clause of the First Amendment, uh, and the second under the Equal Protection Clause. As Ashley mentioned, they also brought three federal preemption claims. Uh, those claims have not yet been ruled on. Uh, the court chose to address the constitutional challenges first. So, uh, as we all know, uh, the Idaho Federal District Court uh, held that the uh, Idaho law was unconstitutional under both constitutional arguments. So, the court found that it violates both the First Amendment and violates, uh, as well, the Equal Protection Clause. So, why uh, did that happen? Uh, first, we're going to start with a little bit of First Amendment background. Uh, so, a very broad overview. Uh, as we know, the First Amendment protects not only the freedom of speech, uh, but also of press and religion. Uh, it applies, of course, only to the federal government, but it was extended to the states under the Incorporation Doctrine in 1925. Uh, so here we've got an Idaho law, and the First Amendment applies because of incorporation. The text actually says the government shall make no law uh, abridging the freedom of speech, um, but the uh, courts have not interpreted that to mean no law precisely. Uh, we'll get to the various tests. Um, some categories of speech, uh, it's important to note, are not protected. Uh, those are defamation, libel, obscenity, and fraud, uh, to name a few. So the basic First Amendment analysis, pretty murky case law, uh, but when you get a broad overview, the first question uh, that you need to ask is whether uh, the uh, activity or speech at issue is in fact speech. Uh, or is it conduct? We'll talk about this as a real question as to video recording. Uh, so is it speech? Is it conduct? Uh, if it's speech or expressive conduct, uh, then the next question uh, is whether it is content-based. And the content-based uh, determination uh, determines how uh, strong the test is. So if uh, the regulation or the statute at issue here uh, is content-based, then it's subject to strict, strict scrutiny. Uh, strict scrutiny is a really difficult test to meet. Uh, the government must prove both the compelling government interest and the law is narrowly tailored, or that there are no other ways uh, of implementing uh, the desired policy objectives than would be the statute. So it has to be narrowly tailored, has to be a compelling government interest. If, on the other hand, it's not content Based, uh, you get sort of an intermediate scrutiny type of analysis where you balance the First Amendment harm against the government's needs. We should also note that time, place, and manner restrictions are okay. The Supreme Court has said that it's okay to restrict speech in certain ways um, as long as there's reasonable ways of communicating uh, the speech in alternate forums. Uh, one example of those uh, is reasonable abortion clinic buffer zones. So a number of the, the court's free speech cases uh, actually involve uh, abortion clinics, and that's where we get a lot of our time, place, and manner uh, jurisprudence. So uh, the other key part of background here that we need to talk about is United States versus Alvarez. And the reason this case is particularly important uh, is that it is, a, it is a recent case from the Supreme Court that talks about false speech. So the Idaho statute, uh, as Ashley mentioned, criminalizes lying. Uh, well, so did the statute at issue at Alvarez, so that's the opinion uh, that district courts and courts of appeals are going to be looking at uh, when they evaluate these farm protection laws. So briefly, in regard to the facts, Xavier Alvarez attended a water district meeting. He was a new board member, and in introducing himself, said that he was a retired Marine, um, and critically, that he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, it turns out uh, that Mr. Alvarez had not, in fact, served in the military at all um, and had lied about his Congressional Medal of Honor. He was prosecuted under the Stolen Valor Act, which makes it a crime to falsely claim receipt of military decorations. So this case uh, makes it all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, uh, and we get a fractured opinion. Uh, one key thing about this decision uh, is that there are not uh, a majority of justices voting for any one rationale. So there's four justices uh, who find uh, that the statute violates the First Amendment um, for these reasons. Um, first, the government argued that false speech was entitled to no protection because it was false. They analogized false speech to defamation and libel, those sorts of actions uh, that uh, speech is entitled to, to fewer uh, protections under. The court disagrees, however, uh, and they hold that a statute that targets falsity and nothing more that their cases had not decided that particular instance, 
um, and where you have a legally cognizable harm, that's one matter. But as in the case of the Stolen Valor Act, which sought to control and suppress all speech related to congressional medals, regardless of any harm. Uh, for example, in Alvarez's case, um, he may have uh, lied to bolster his uh, credentials or those sorts of things, uh, but there was no real harm flowing uh, from that lie, and the statute itself doesn't require any sort of harm or the lie he made for material gain. So four justices found that the act violated uh, the First Amendment. Two justices, however, Justice Breyer and Justice Kagan, concurred, um, and they their concurrence is interesting in that they uh, state that false uh, statements actually enjoy very little First Amendment protection, uh, but not zero. So the idea here is that false statements uh, are less likely than true statements to contribute to the marketplace of ideas uh, as something having less value. Uh, they are uh, more susceptible to government regulation. And they applied a balancing test uh, or you know, intermediate scrutiny, which again balances uh, the harm to the First Amendment or the harm to an individual's free speech uh, against the government's objectives uh, in regulating the speech. They too, however, found that the statute failed because it was too broad. There was no uh, requirement of harm or any of those sorts of limitations in the statute, no limitation uh, as a, in time, place, or manner. Uh, any uh, private discussion that was false about a Congressional Medal of Honor or any other uh, wartime award subjected uh, the, a person representing falsely uh, to criminal prosecution. So in their opinion, in the concurrence's opinion, uh, the statute was just too broad. So that's how you get the six votes. So you've got six votes that are in favor of uh, striking the statute down. You also have a dissent uh, authored by Justice Alito, uh, pretty cut and dried, and he just uh, basically says uh, that false speech is not entitled to First Amendment protection at all. So he would take the entire category of false speech off the table. So this opinion turns out to be really important uh, when we're talking about the misrepresentation prong in Otter. So we've got two key questions, again, the misrepresentation provisions and whether they violate the First Amendment uh, when we look at Alvarez. And then a second question is whether the recording provisions violate the First Amendment, at least as applied to employees. So the Otter Court, the Idaho Federal District Court, first determined uh, that the Idaho statute, Section 187042, was a content-based restriction. And how the court decided that is they looked uh, to the target, and it said that they target undercover investigators uh, who seek to suppress speech critical of animal agricultural practices uh, as opposed to any other industry practices. So in the court's view, this regulation, or excuse me, statute, is content-based uh, because it specifically targets agriculture, again, as opposed to other uh, industries more broadly, um, and also uh, is intended to suppress speech that's critical of agricultural practices rather than speech uh, that is affirmative uh, or uh, laudatory of those sorts of practices. The court also disagreed with the state's arguments uh, that it's not intended to protect private property. So to look uh, first at uh, the misrepresentation prong. So the Otter Court, uh, after determining uh, that it was content-based, uh, found that the misrepresentation prong had to meet strict scrutiny, um, and it failed under Alvarez. So the Otter Court emphasizes that Alvarez held that the government may criminalize false statements only when those statements themselves cause a legally cognizable harm. So up until that point, uh, tracking pretty well with, with Alvarez. Here, however, the court continues, Idaho has done nothing to show the lies that it seeks to prohibit cause any legally cognizable harm, uh, since it does not limit its misrepresentation prohibition uh, to those that actually result in torts or crimes under other state laws, uh, but rather sweeps into its prohibition all lies used to gain access the court found that no harm existed. So those of you that are lawyers, uh, thinking back to your tort or property class, might have some real difficulty uh, with the court's opinions here, uh, and for good reason. So in my opinion, at least, uh, the court's ruling on the misrepresentation prong of the statute is highly suspect uh, for a couple of reasons. First, if you look expressly at the Alvarez plurality, 
they uh, mention false claims that are made to, coincidentally, obtain offers of employment uh, and suggest that those sorts of things, uh, lying to obtain valuable consideration, would not, in fact, be protected. Uh, so you've got a problem with Alvarez uh, generally. Um, more, I think, to the point here is the governor, or excuse me, the court's finding that there was no harm. That just can't be right because trespass is the quintessential harm to private property. Uh, we all know from first year uh, torts, first year property, that one does not even uh, need to uh, harm property in order for it to be a tort uh, or criminally liable. Uh, all that's required is to enter uh, within the quiet enjoyment uh, of one's private property. So stepping onto property counts as a trespass. Uh, that in and of itself is the harm, not any resulting um, crop or livestock. Uh, or property damage. So if such actions like common law trespass, uh, common law torts uh, can be treated uh, constitutionally as permissible as a tort, then they can certainly be treated constitutionally as a crime. So I think a real problem here with the misrepresentation prong of the court's analysis uh, in saying that no harm exists, uh, you have a clear common law harm when uh, an individual uh, through either fraud um, or some other uh, way enters property without consent. Uh, another small point, uh, but if you count votes, there's five justices uh, that found false statements to have very little speech value. And they were concerned in Alvarez, uh, the, the two concurring justices, with the broadness of the uh, Stolen Valor Act, which uh, applied to any false statement uh, privately or publicly uh, without harm. Uh, in this case, you've got misrepresentations uh, but it's tied to gain access uh, either to property uh, or to records or to employment. Uh, so I think you have a much closer nexus here uh, with uh, the uh, lie uh, and the resulting uh, entry uh, into the property, which would be harm. So again, the misrepresentation analysis, I think, quite problematic. Now coming to the recording provision, uh, the law for, for audiovisual recordings uh, is a little less clear. Uh, what the Otter Court held, the District Court in Idaho, is that the statute was unconstitutional. Again, they're calling it content-based because audiovisual recordings are purely expressive activity. Uh, we'll come back to that. That's not necessarily true. Um, but they started from that premise. Um, then they said that the statute facially discriminates uh, because it concerns conduct only about ad the ag production facilities operations. Uh, then they also went into the legislative history uh, of the act uh, that talked uh, about the dairy video, those sorts of things, and found that the underlying purpose uh, was to silence animal activists uh, who were critical of animal agriculture. So two things to notice here. Uh, in section 187042, unlike, uh, I believe, and Ashley can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but the video uh, recording is specific to ag production. Uh, so one thing states could do is to uh, possibly avoid a content determination uh, is to apply sort of video uh, or audio limits uh, on private property and in, on industry in general. Um, so here the court was troubled uh, about the targeting uh, of ag production facilities. But there's some additional problems, uh, or at least wrinkles, uh, with the district court's recording holding. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, the law concerning audiovisual visual is much more nuanced uh, than the court lay, lets on. Also, legislative history and looking at specific statements uh, regarding uh, the purpose of the statute are most likely off limits uh, because of a Supreme Court case called O'Brien. Uh, in O'Brien, O'Bri the Supreme Court cast doubt about looking at individual legislators' uh, opinions expressed on the floor or even in committee reports uh, to determine uh, whether uh, the First Amendment was violated. So to look just briefly here, we, we, this would be a webinar in and of itself, but at the law regarding uh, videotaping and uh, photography. So it's a bit of a mess. The Supreme Court has never directly addressed uh, photographer or videographer's rights uh, under the First Amendment. Um, but we have a few uh, cases that sort of point us in the direction uh, that the court might go. So as uh, we all know, again, the First Amendment talks about speech. Uh, it does not talk about conduct. Uh, but here, um, 
the uh, court has extended First Amendment protections to expressive conduct. So sort of the quintessential case uh, is students wearing armbands uh, to protest various wars. Uh, the court found that those armbands were protected free speech uh, because they were intended to express and convey a message. So even though an armband in and of, it, in and of itself is not speech, it can still be expressive. So the test uh, to determine whether something that's sort of a non-speech item, such as a recording uh, or the, the act of recording, uh, is protected, the plaintiff must show two things. First, that they intend to communicate a message, and second, that they have an audience uh, to receive that message, uh, regardless of the medium. So again, to go back with the student with the armband, uh, the armband was meant to signify uh, uh, a protest uh, to various governmental activities, and the intended message uh, was the teachers and other students, or messenger, rather, or messagee, uh, was the students uh, and teachers uh, at the school. So both had an expressive message uh, and a potential uh, audience. A key here, um, I think is a, a comment picked up here, uh, but such speech is protected in the public forum. So there are a number of cases uh, dealing with uh, videotapes, audio tapes, uh, as we've all seen recently uh, on mainstream media of police uh, engaging uh, in various policing activities. And the general rule here is that police uh, tapings, audio and visual of police activity uh, is a matter of public concern uh, and can take place uh, so long as the person taking the video uh, or the photograph or the audio recording is standing uh, on what's known as a public forum. So that would be any public street, that would be any public sidewalk, that would be any governmental building, uh, the sorts of things that we associate uh, with public property uh, rather than private property. In contrast, uh, even uh, as the ACLU's website explains, I'm not one to, uh, to give a lot of weight to private property concerns. Uh, the ACLU says that on private property, it's usually the owner uh, that can set the rules regarding videotaping. Uh, and that rule uh, would also apply uh, to uh, 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 employees. So employers can set the rules uh, as to uh, videotaping generally. Again, uh, this law is pretty murky. So to circle back uh, to the content neutral uh, determination, again, the finding that uh, a statute like Idaho's is content based subjects it to strict scrutiny. Uh, if on the other hand, it's content neutral, you get an intermediate or a balancing sort of test. So uh, Idaho is content neutral, does not regulate speech based on what is said, uh, but instead on where it is said um, at an agricultural production facility it was the argument. Uh, they compared it uh, to the buffer zones uh, that we talked about outside of abortion clinics. Uh, in this instance, the Supreme Court has held that such clinics uh, are uh, content neutral. Um, so that was Idaho's basic argument, that it doesn't matter uh, what is said, uh, rather, but, but where it's said. Uh, the court didn't buy that argument. I think, uh, in particular, if you look at the statutory language, uh, it says enters an agricultural production facility. So Idaho may have an uphill argument here uh, when and if they appeal, arguing that it's content neutral uh, because of that express tie uh, to ag facility. So under strict scrutiny, uh, as we've talked about, uh, the statute falls, uh, at least according to the district court in Otter. Uh, they found no compelling interest. Uh, the district court, uh, again, misreads Alvarez as finding that the government had no compelling interest uh, in uh, protecting uh, the honor of certain governmental awards. Uh, in fact, the court said the opposite. The court said that there is a compelling governmental interest. Um, in protecting those awards, uh, just that it was not narrowly tailored. Uh, in this case, though, the court finds that there's no compelling interest in protecting private property, uh, at least in singling out agricultural property. Uh, the court then went on to say even if there is a compelling interest, it's not narrowly tailored because there are other laws that are sufficiently protect these interests. Um, and in all events, ag operations can engage in what's called counter speech. Or, or informing the public or the audience that was reached by the video uh, or the recording uh, of the good practices uh, that agricultural production facilities engage in. 
So it fails both prongs, uh, the strict scrutiny analysis, uh, and then fails under uh, the uh, um, First Amendment. So the Equal Protection Clause argument will go really quickly through here. I want to get to uh, what I see are a number of questions. Uh, but the court also, I think quite surprisingly, uh, held that the uh, Idaho law also violates equal protection. So general framework, thinking back uh, to law school, for those of you that are lawyers, if you have a suspect class, uh, race, gender, those sorts of things, um, you are, uh, the, the statute is subjected to heightened scrutiny. Uh, generally, uh, strict scrutiny, but in the case of gender, uh, you have intermediate scrutiny. So a non-suspect class, uh, on the other hand, a classification uh, between optometrists and non-licensed optometrists, or those sorts of things, uh, gets rational basis review. So there was a bit of an argument about whether there was a classification at all. Uh, Idaho argued that there wasn't. Uh, again, if you look at Section D of the statute, it does talk about ag production facilities. Uh, so the court found that it uh, discriminates uh, or classifies uh, between the ag industry and other industries. And then they moved on to uh, what was rational basis review. Um, but as you'll notice in the bold portion here, uh, they say it several times, the state fails to explain why uh, existing laws don't serve this purpose, uh, pr pr the state fails to provide a legitimate explanation, uh, those sorts of things. And uh, this is, uh, again, not consistent uh, with ordinary equal protection analysis. So on our next slide, we have just uh, what the courts generally engage in in rational basis review. And the whole idea uh, of rational basis review is that after Lochner, so post Lochner, uh, courts are not to be engaged in the idea of determining whether a law is a good law or is a bad law. Um, instead, they're just supposed to defer to the legislature unless there's a specific uh, classic, an invidious uh, classification uh, such as a race uh, or gender or another protected class. So if you're doing general rational basis review, uh, the state doesn't need to proffer an explanation. So unlike uh, the rational basis review that the court uh, undertook, generally the state doesn't need to explain itself. Um, there's, there's really kind of open-ended quotes from Supreme Court cases saying that it's irrelevant what end the government's actually seeking. Uh, the court doesn't uh, go into that. Uh, statutes can be based on rational speculation. There doesn't need to be evidence. Um, and this is, is really key here, that courts are obligated to seek out conceivable reasons and that courts themselves can hypothesize legitimate interest. So it's not only uh, that the state doesn't have to prove uh, that their statute uh, is the best statute ever, but courts uh, go out of their way to hypothesize uh, legitimate interest. Here you've obviously got a legitimate interest uh, in property protection um, and the distinction between the the ag industry and other industries uh, would very likely not, I lost my screen here, but the distinction between ag industries and others uh, would likely not, there we go, uh, be problematic under the Supreme Court's jurisprudence. Uh, in fact, uh, in a case called Lee Optical, uh, the court said that a distinction between optometrists and opticians, even though motivated uh, by the legislature's desire to protect one of those at the expense of the others, uh, did not fall under rational basis. So a very uh, deferential test. Um, and I think surprising here that uh, the court uh, struck down it on equal protection grounds. So I think here the key to the decision, um, which I would argue is more grounded in policy, um, from the judge's perspective, is that animal agriculture, as they say, is a heavily regulated industry. That's where you get the preemption claims we mentioned briefly earlier. Uh, and because it's heavily regulated, um, that uh, food and production safety are, uh, the court argues that they are matters of the utmost public concern. And speech on such matters, the court says, is at the heart of the First Amendment. Again, I think this really looks like substantive due process review, something that the courts have eschewed uh, since really the 1930s. Um, the day is uh, gone, the court has said, when we use the due process clause to strike down state laws uh, because a particular judge uh, views them as unwise. Uh, so I think here we have a district court judge who's very concerned uh, about these matters, uh, perhaps rightly so, but, but I think the constitutional analysis um, is a bit suspect. 
So the bottom line here, uh, misrepresentation provisions um, aimed at specific tort crimes, such as entering property, such as uh, stealing records, uh, such as lying to gain employees, uh, employment, I would argue easily satisfy the Alvarez harm standard. Uh, so I don't believe uh, that that part will be upheld uh, on review. Uh, the videotaping provision is more nuanced. Uh, as we discussed, uh, the courts are unsettled as to how specifically uh, videotaping provisions uh, may be applied. Um, this, uh, because it's arguably content-based as it singles out ag operations, uh, the state law may require some special justification, uh, and on appeal, the Ninth Circuit might find that justification uh, absent. Uh, however, to the extent that the court uh, writes broadly and suggests that there's a First Amendment right to lie to video on private property, I just think that's simply incorrect. It would be inconsistent with trespass and fraud statutes, but the court itself admits uh, are viable. So if you can have a trespass uh, that doesn't violate the First Amendment, uh, then surely you can have a law uh, that uh, prohibits uh, videotaping on private property. So uh, that is the end of my presentation. Um, and I can uh, start here with some questions. Uh, do you have any recommendations, Paul, as to how I think I've got a ton of them? Um, I have one, Aaron, that I uh, that was pointed out. Um, Someone was asking about the question um, about legislative history and sure. how do we discern a law's purpose if you don't look at the legislative history, something to that effect. So that's a big debate in constitutional law. So generally speaking, um, the textualist wing of the court uh, would say that you look you determine a law's purpose uh, by looking at the text of the statute. And you don't care even what the legislature intended to do. Uh, you care what they did, in fact, do when you look at the statute. Uh, you apply common sense meanings uh, to the terms of that statute. Um, and I, for one, find that argument pretty compelling uh, because, as we all know, legislators can say uh, any number of things, any number of inconsistent things uh, from the floor of either the House or the Senate at both the federal level uh, and the state level. Uh, more particularly to this case, uh, it's the Supreme Court, uh, I believe, uh, written by Justice Blackmun uh, in O'Brien. I could be wrong about the particular justice. Uh, but uh, a majority opinion in which the court said, when you're looking at the First Amendment, uh, you really shouldn't delve into the legislative history. You should look at the text of the statute uh, to determine whether it's content-based. So that's the Supreme Court saying that in this precise context. Right. See if there's some more questions coming through. Paul, did you have any pointed out? I did not. I'm trying to go back through and pick them up. We've had a lot of questions. Sorry, Aaron. <laughs> I guess we could go with Justin's question since it's on top, and then we can try to find some more. The one in. Sure. Sure, so Arlington Heights uh, involves invidious discrimination against a particular class. Um, but generally speaking, Arlington Heights is sort of a mixed uh, review type of case. Generally, you have three types of review. You've got uh, strict scrutiny, you have intermediate scrutiny, which applies to gender, and then you have rational basis uh, scrutiny. In Arlington Heights uh, and in Romer versus Eben, uh, the court says, uh, that uh, in those cases, uh, you are looking at uh, sort of motives uh, to determine whether there was an improper classification. Uh, it's called rational basis with bite, in particular with, with Romer versus Evans. Uh, but that's a particularly, I think, uh, unusual case. Uh, Cleburne's another case. Uh, Romer dealt uh, with uh, homosexual individuals. Uh, Cleburne dealt uh, with the elderly uh, in uh, homes. Uh, so particular types of uh, groups that might be uh, subject to majority pressures. Uh, I don't think uh, that you have that sort of thing going on here. So I, I guess to Justin's broader point about uh, some legislative history, um, in either case, uh, the question uh, is whether it satisfies rational basis review uh, for the equal protection analysis. 
I think there's no question uh, that this statute would satisfy rational basis review. Uh, when you're talking about the First Amendment analysis, then you've got to break out uh, the misrepresentation provisions, which I think uh, are fit very nicely within the confines of Alvarez, um, and you have to sort out the um, videotaping provisions, uh, which uh, may or may not uh, uh, survive review. Uh, but the whole question as to legislative history that Dustin's asking about goes to whether the uh, statute itself is content-based, um, but either way, uh, you still end up uh, under Alvarez for the misrepresentations um, and under the videotape cases uh, for the video recording. See if we can move to a different question here. We had a larger question about read, but I'm still trying to read it all. My chat box has gone small. Let me see if I can make this bigger so we can all see it. There we go. Yeah. So there was a question about Reed versus Town of Gilbert and with Justice Thomas describing content-based regulations as those that are on the face. If you're seeing the one I'm at, Aaron. Sure. So those that are on their face distinguish between speech and conduct based on its idea or message. Yes, I agree with that. That's just what I said, that um, uh, if, in fact, you can look at legislative history, um, which I'm suspect of, uh, given O'Brien, uh, but if those, Justice Thomas does not look at legislative history, he looks at those regulations on their face, uh, and if they distinguish uh, based on its message, uh, which as I mentioned, uh, Section D of the statute might, uh, given that it mentions agricultural facilities particularly. Uh, so then uh, you might have something uh, that is content-based, uh, as the district court found, uh, and then you're in strict scrutiny land. Um, so that's, I think we're in agreement on that. But again, Justice Thomas would not okay looking at legislative history. Um, Justin has a question, um, would SCOTUS take this? That's, that's a good question, possibly. It, it depends on what the courts uh, of appeals do with this. Um, as Ashley's uh, presentation aptly demonstrated, there are a number uh, of different statutes that uh, go about uh, these farm protection or ag ag laws in different ways. So a court can, usually takes a case uh, for one of two reasons, either the importance of the issue uh, or because of a circuit split. Um, so the issue uh, is important, um, but generally a circuit split is the more likely avenue of getting review, and the court would probably want to see some sort of direct split. So if the Ninth Circuit, uh, for example, strikes down the videographer uh, provisions in this case, um, if the uh, Fifth Circuit, for example, upheld uh, very uh, closely related language, uh, then you'd have a direct split. The one thing that's going to complicate matters here is that the state statutes vary considerably. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good question here. Uh, the uh, Kyra, I'm not sure if I'm saying that not uh, that correctly. Um, the Equal Protection Clause does apply strict scrutiny for fundamental rights um, that has not been extended to freedom of speech. Uh, Erwin Ch Chemerinsky uh, at Duke Law School made that argument in an amicus brief. Um, it's sort of a novel argument, an interesting argument, uh, but the court in this case spends about two paragraphs on it. Um, so that would be something, a sort of a first impression. Uh, for uh, the Supreme Court. Got a few more people typing, so maybe. If we missed your question, please type it back in. There's been a lot of discussion going on. So some of the questions have gotten lost in some of the discussion. And I think Jane had raised her hand earlier and had a question.
All right, Jane's typing, so we have a question coming. That's okay. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> All right. I guess if there's any further questions um, that we didn't answer today, um, we both have our emails available, Aaron and I. Um, so feel free to email one, either one of us or Paul if you have any other questions as well. Um, and then I think Paul had a few comments to make if we're ready to wrap up uh, to answer David's question the first slideshow will be available uh, we just didn't get it online before it so we'll have probably have it online by tomorrow and we will send out a link to all the attendees with it and where a video of this can be found and again to a link if you see down at the bottom in the right the links to the webinars there's an evaluation for this webinar if you would take a minute to evaluate the speakers the content and let us know what you think like in up at the top in the slide it says um, future webinars we hope to hold one um, the first of the year in the new year on right to farm developments um, some other webinars are in the future and before we got started I forgot to thank our sponsors so there at the bottom you see um, all the logos of all our sponsors who help get the word out about this webinar so if you are part of those groups or you know anybody that is please take a moment and thank them for helping us out and with that said I would like to thank Aaron and Ashley today for presenting and you have their email addresses if you have any questions that were not answered please email them and thank you guys and that is all thank you